Greetings and welcome to the podcast channel of the Major Contemporary Strategic Issues Chair. The theme for 2024 is Confrontations and Strategic Recompositions. This episode is an extract from the lecture given by Gustav Gressel, Associate Researcher, ECFR Berlin, European Council on Foreign Relations. The conference is entitled The Russian-Ukrainian War and the Future Military Balance in Europe. Don't hesitate to subscribe to our podcast or YouTube channel to keep up to date with all our publications. We hope you enjoy listening. For not speaking proper French. I I should have learned it in military academy, but the only only effect it had back then uh, was that it overlaid my Spanish and I continued to confuse both and at the end speak none. Um, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear online uh, visitors, it is a, a, a great pleasure to uh, to have you here and to talk a bit about the topic, how this war might end or not. Um, before I start my explanation, I have to I have to make a slight confession and a bit of an excuse. Um, when I got the invitation, I I, I scratched my head and went, oh my God, it's of course very honorable to, to be uh, invited to, to such a prestigious university, but um, I will go to Ukraine soon for another trip. How do I do that? And my wife said, Gustav, you can't say no to the Sorbonne. You, you, you cannot say. And, you know, as a soldier, <clears throat> uh, the French, uh, the, 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 the former French prime minister Clemenceau once said, uh, uh, a, a woman should be glad to marry a soldier. Not only can he a cook and knit and so first and foremost he knows to obey so i'm here uh <laughs> you can you can either thank or curse my wife <laughs> um but of course after the confession it's it's a hugely complex uh and complicated topic um and at the beginning i thought oh my god i can't talk uh it's such an elusive topic i can't talk about how the war ends because it's probably won't uh, for the foreseeable future and the foreseeable years. And then when I slept over it, I thought, maybe just because of that, actually, we should talk about it. So the possible end of uh, the war in Ukraine at the time being is mostly up to speculations. And these speculations, unfortunately, have some political relevance because as the uh, head of the SPD, for example, in uh, last week's debate about Taurus missiles said that we now need to think about freezing the war. Uh, there is a lot of wishful thinking uh, involved in possible, in possible discussions or pos- discussions on a possible end of the war. For the time being, uh, as it is, uh, it is still a dichotomous event. So it can be either one or the other solution. Either Russia wins militarily or Ukraine wins militarily. Uh, Russia, for the time being, seems to be closer to that moment, um, depending on Western support, depending on uh, the fate of the U.S. elections in autumn, which not only the presidential, but also the legislative uh, elections to Congress and Senate, um, might allow Russia to win this war by 2025. That's a fairly early point. For Ukraine to win this war, it would need increased and continuous military support by the West, and then it could win once Russia's military apparatus has exhausted its uh, resources of material. And this will happen if you're an absolute optimist by 2026, but I guess by 2028 it will actually become light. A truce of exhaustion in between these two dates is theoretically possible, but practically very unlikely. Why? Well, let's digress into things. Let's let's explore first the Russian war aims. Russia overall started the war. What are they fighting for? If you go back into Russian foreign policy concepts, even the first one, Putin. Uh, issued as a prime minister, but even older ones going back to the Yeltsin times, you basically see see three basic steps or um, stages. One, to improve the industrial, financial, technological base that Russia is working with, to modernize Russia. For that, they need some sort of 
accommodation with the West. Second stage to reintegrate the territories of the former USSR. And this also this started long before Putin with various discussions about the Commonwealth of Independent States and how it should be organized and what should be the exact competences of it on which not. Um, but of course, with Putin, it took a much more energetic and violent turn. And three, if you have completed stage one and two, to reinstate Russia as a great power. Uh, this has been camouflaged around a lot of other debates about multipolarity, about the just world order. That's a Chinese term for the same thing. Um, but it is important if we conceptualize what Russia wants out of this war to know that these three things are integrated. Um, and uh, the, the, the Russia, Russia's foreign policy that tries to achieve them and tries to uh, bring Ukraine back into Russian control is quite old. And its, mil and its political interference into Ukrainian domestic affairs to that is also quite old. Um, basically, we can track it to day one of Ukraine's independence and the attempt to prevent the independence of Ukraine because the, the independence of the Baltic countries did disturb the Soviet Union, but the independence of Ukraine ended the Soviet Union. Um, then basically the Belarus, uh, Ukraine and Russia, once it was clear that these countries were divorced, uh, that the Soviet Union had it. Um, we can we can trace it back to the continuous negotiations about the Black Sea Fleet and how it was used to gain a foothold in Ukrainian policies that were concluded with the 1997 Black Sea Fleet Treaty. We can trace it back to the Orange Revolution, uh, where Russia was caught cold-handed uh, in in its attempt to falsify the elections in favor of Viktor Yanukovych. Um, we have then the 2006 GASP crisis. We have uh, a permanent propaganda war, subversion, payment of, of local actors in Ukraine to work on the behalf of Russia, a, a spy war between the countries that, <clears throat> of course, on the Russian side made use of a lot of uh, weaknesses and institutional weaknesses of the Ukrainian side. And then, of course, 2014, the first military escalation between the two countries uh, with the occupation of Crimea and then uh, with the occupation of Donbass, uh, the first uh, Minsk agreement that followed in September 2014, the second Minsk uh, Accord of February 2015, uh, the first two ceasefires that did not end the war. Um, and uh, it, as a consequence of the Minsk II process alone, uh, Ukraine and Russia held more than 200 contact rounds to negotiate the exact terms uh, of an impl uh, implementation of the treaty and had 20 different and independent ceasefire agreements between the two parties. All of them, of course, uh, led nowhere. Uh, the... The Russian interpretation of the Minsk agreement was that Minsk granted uh, Russia a foothold in Ukrainian domestic politics. Uh, Russian delegations would often arrive in Minsk negotiation rounds with uh, ready formulated le legislative texts they demanded Ukraine to implement as demanded by Russia uh, in order to grant the Russian proxy regimes that it had erected on, on the Russian soil, a de facto constitutional status um, and enforce a, a quasi-federalization of Ukraine. On Ukraine, on the other hand, perceived the Minsk agreement as an agreement that at the end would lead to reintegration of the Donbass. Uh, the escalation and the more blunt formulation of Russian war aims came then in 2021, when in summer Putin published his uh, article about the historical unity of Ukraine and the Russian people. And uh, basically, he described Ukraine as an accident of history that uh, should have never have happened. And the reversing of this accident of history would be the key Russian um, foreign policy goal uh, that needs to be taken care of. Uh, and if you look into all of Putin's larger speeches since, like when he recognized the so-called People's Republics, when he declared war on Ukraine, 
um, uh, the speeches of the annexation of the occupied territories. Uh, his his speech before the All Russian Assembly in November last year, which was also quite a revealing speech. Um, his speech uh, uh, to uh, the state of the nation, uh, his newest speeches, all of them reiterate that uh, Ukraine should not exist and that Russians and Ukrainians are one and they need to to fulfill that in practice. And that, of course, translates them into the two declared war aims that Russia has in this war. This is denazification, another quotation mark, and demilitarization. Denazification means to eradicate uh, the intellectual, political, journalistic, um, security elites of Ukraine, those who support an independent Ukraine. And demilitarization means to make the country vulnerable to Russian pressure and military aggression in order to enforce any later demands by them, by military means. And especially on denazification and on sort of erasing the Ukrainian nation, if you look into the practices of, of Russia as an occupying power, you see that unfolding, not only the uh, euphemistic uh, uh, call, uh, <clears throat> naming of these uh, camps as filtration camps, but you filter out elements that you don't want to keep in society. Uh, the, the enforced mobilization on occupied territories to pull away men and send them uh, to quite suicidal jobs on the front, um, that basically breaks the lineage of male population in the occupied territories. There's uh, no other territory in the Russian Federation that has a so high degree of people mobilized for war than the occupied territories in Ukraine, particularly DNR, LNR. Uh, you see this genocidal intent also in how sexual violence against women and children is uh, perpetrated by Russian soldiers. Um, use numerous accounts uh, of Russian soldiers uh, raping women and especially raping children in order to discourage them from having any further sexual intercourse, not not to have kids. You don't want the enemy people to have kids because you don't want them to repopulate. Um, uh, in the occupied areas, as if you speak Ukrainian, you might disappear the next day. Um, there are people arbitrarily shot because it is sus suspected that they might wait for the Ukrainian army or they might have hidden symbols of the Ukrainian state in their home. So this kind of policy is is implemented. Um, and it shows the amount of radicalization that the Russian war aims and the Russian post-Soviet policies has undergone on in the last decade. But it also shows us that Russian war aims are more about their own identity than about Ukraine. And they are more about identity and irrational factors such as history, how to deal with history, than tangible, negotiable objects like security, transparency, trust-building measures, disarmament, etc. You cannot you you can negotiate about the latter ones, but it's hard to negotiate about identity. Uh, if if the Russian elite and it's not only Putin alone, if the Russian elite are suffering from a Versailles syndrome that they think they their nation cannot exist without having control over territories that now belong to another state because they were once part of your state. Um, it is very hard to cast that into rational demands. And this makes negotiations extremely difficult. Um, and then last but not least, I would remind back to the third stage of Russian foreign policy, the issue of great power. Um, if you go back to December 17th, uh, 2021, when Russia put uh, a proposal for uh, security uh, assurance measures on the table, uh, the Senate to the United States and to NATO, then you basically get a formal glimpse of what actually it means, or what kind of order Russia would mean. It is a prohibition of uh, especially security relations by NATO to countries that Russia perceives in their sphere of influence, uh, a rollback of the NATO enlargement de facto, because you withdraw all the military assets, a withdrawal of US nuclear weapons from Europe, 
in order to make Europe more dependable and uh, like mailable. Um, conquering Ukraine is not the end goal, but it is, in Moscow's point of view, the most important cornerstone of making Russia a great power again. A Russia that, at a later point, um, needs to fight to conquer 80% of Ukraine is a regional power. A Russia that has conquered Ukraine and dominates Europe militarily is a global power. Um, and yeah, as I said, Russia works very, very long on all of these three agendas. Uh, but by signing a ceasefire or freezing the conflict, by retracting from their maximalist goals, Moscow would basically seize its long-standing, not only identity goals, but its long-standing foreign policy goals of making Russia a great power again. And I don't see that Putin or somebody else in the Kremlin is uh, really willing to do so. Now, let's switch side. Look at Ukrainian wines. Um, the Ukrainian wines, of course, are first and foremost survival. Uh, but survival needs to be operationalized. Survival has a security dimension to be sure that you are able to withstand a further Russian aggression or a attempt of Russia to fight the war again in a couple of years. Uh, and this is actually the, the most pressing issue that Ukrainians have. If you talk to Ukrainians and not only politicians, but normal people on the street, um, what they think of the war and what should be Ukrainians' um, sort of end state, they say, well, we, we need to fight this war now so that our ki children will not have to fight uh, the same war yeah, when they're old. Um, now, of course, humble people on the street can't operationalize when sort of what kind of security conditions need to be met for Russia not, not to challenge their kids in 20 or 25 years. But this is sort of the general desire for, for Ukrainians in, in the war that is shared pretty much across, across society. So it means having the right to maintain its armed forces, a at best integration into Euro-Atlantic security structures, because that would increase immediately the costs for Russia trying to make another attempt at, at subjugating Ukraine. And of course, economic sustainability, uh, being in a state but uh, Ukraine has an independent economy integrated in market structures that are not controlled by Russia and cannot be leveraged by Russia against it. Uh, having access to export routes, having access to Black Sea, etc. Territory. Um, territory is a very important dimension in Ukrainian's definition of what, what the end state should be because Ukraine has made this experience that um, Russian controlled territories of Ukraine are the perfect springboard uh, for further military aggression. Um, they want, at best, no DNR, LNR, or any kind of construct on their soil that would allow Russia to have or entitle Russia for the job of protecting someone in the country. Uh, they also have made the experience that Crimea is an important springboard, not only for a land invasion, but especially for air and missile attacks. They're bombed basically from Crimea every day and every night. Um, and that every gray zone, a zone where sort of lawlessness persists, um, would be used, or that status is not really clear, will be used um, to harm Ukraine at a land stage. Ukrainians also know that there is no West German solution for them. Uh, this a lot talked about sort of Ukraine in the West that can't you have a West German solution that will reunite um, with the occupied areas when Putin is dead and the Russians have come to terms with the fact that they're probably, probably that this was a dumb idea to start the war in the first place. The problems Ukrainians have with that is that they know that there will be no Ukrainian East Ukraine like there was an East Germany that was still an East Germany because the curriculas are changed the youth is brainwashed. Kids are deported to Russia. Um, the, the cultural heritage, you see museums emptied and artifacts brought out. So the whole Ukrainian identity of the people that still stayed is destroyed 
and Russia brings in new settlers um, to to live in the space that was emptied out by people that fled or were shot. So the ethnical composition, if you look at the ethnical composition on Crimea, it has already substantially changed. And they know that in a couple of years, the, the ethnical composition of the occupied areas will have substantially changed. And this is not about... East Germany, West Germany, this, if you take the German comparison, this is Kaliningrad, Königsberg. It will never be a German city again. Every German knows that. Um, and if Mariupol stays where it is, it will never be a Ukrainian city again. Um, of course, I mean, they also know that, for example, Crimea, if it's demilitarized and under international supervision, or can talk about other things. Um, there is still elasticity in a bit of that, but at the core, they don't want, they want to decide their independence now in this war. And, and the fourth, and that is also a very, very difficult moment to negotiate is, and, but it's becoming stronger the longer the war lasts. Um, this is the element of justice in the Ukrainian war aims. It was very fuzzy defined at the beginning of the war. But it becomes stronger the more atrocities happen on the occupied areas, um, and and on sort of from the Ukrainian side is we, we don't want if there is peace and we go to Berlin and shop at the Kurfürstendamm and then we meet people who have just ordered all these kind of war crimes in our country and, and they, they line up uh, in 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 the supermarket behind us. Um, uh, yeah, so. If you look at the two war arms, there, there is not much that, you know, normally say, okay, this is war aim A and this is the war aim of nation B and somewhere in the middle, if everybody cuts down some of the moments, we'll get to a ceasefire. Um, this is particularly impossible, if, if not extremely difficult in this case. And we haven't yet digressed into legal obstacles. Um, uh, for example, Russia has a constitutional amendment in 2018 that no Russian territory is ever to be given back to anybody. Um, as Russia has annexed five of Ukraine's oblasts, it fully controls only one of them, Crimea, but the others it has in its own legal system annexed. That basically puts an end to negotiations. Ukraine, on the other hand, has a law that any peace treaty proposal with Russia would have to undergo a popular vote. And a lot of things that might be um, explainable to diplomats and foreign policy experts might be completely inexplicit, uh, inexplainable to, work, to the population. And you do not get this world. So there are technical obstacles as well, but I think they the mental obstacles are so big that the legal and technical obstacles are are actually by far overshadowed. So the war will continue. Well, how will it continue? Um, ever since Solution wrote this article about a stalemate, people talk about uh, a static war like trench warfare and World War One. That is partially true. It is by now a war of attrition. Um, uh, both parties have problems in regaining the initiative and seizing the moment to induce maneuver warfare, like having a breakthrough on the other side and sort of induce decisive operations against the others. That is predominantly because of technological progress in terms of artificial intelligence, computing, drones, um, electronic warfare, uh, you know what the other side is going to do before the other side executes an order. Uh, you have fast artillery that can immediately put quite precise fire on whatever the other side is doing. Um, and well, whoever survives the artillery fire will be caught by first person view drones. Um, the problem is, of course, for both uh, resources are not endless. Uh, here, are, for example, the supply, the war supply for main battle tanks. Um, Russia has steadily increased its production of new T90M models. Um, there are now roughly 
for this year, they will probably produce 200 of them per year. The large swath of main battle tanks, however, comes from depots where Russia is refurbishing old Cold War um, uh, equipment that the Soviet Union had built up over decades. And this is basically between 800 and 1,000 main battle tanks they do a year right now. Um, this is uh, supplying the war. The war effort. On the Ukrainian side, Ukraine gets what was left over from Central Eastern Europe, NATO co uh, countries transitioning from also packed equipment to NATO equipment that was basically 2022. Um, last year, they got a bit of uh, Cold War legacy equipment that was refurbished and uh, this equipment is going to expire this year. If we look into armored transportation, uh, it's pretty much the same picture. So, in and uh, on the left side, you see what Ukraine got, and on the right side, you see what what Russia got. Um, here, things look a bit better for Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine got a lot of leftovers from the so-called global war on terror. These are light armored vehicles that are no longer needed. We got a lot from former Soviet um, allies transitioning into NATO standards and it got a bit of Cold War legacy equipment like Mardas and Bradleys who were left over from downsizing um, uh, from downsizing uh, Western European and American forces after the end of the Cold War. Now, if you see you see that on the Western side, the kind of green thing, which is this year, is substantially smaller than on the Russian side. That is because the Russians have a continuous defense industry and they they can they have withdrawn those vehicles they deem repairable and they are one by one working to restore them and continue to field them into their armed forces. On the Ukrainian side, they live on donations. And these donations are by and large leftover vehicles. The problem is here, the two main poles for these donations have either expired, like old Soviet legacy systems, or are about to expire this year. And uh, there is no tangible defense industrial effort to produce much new that Ukraine can use in the next war. On ammunition, or I'll come later to ammunition, the problem for Ukraine to sustain the war, you see here the losses, red Russia, uh, blue Ukraine, two factors. First, for what it is, Ukraine is doing a good job keeping up a favorable rate of attrition. Purely militarily, this is not a bad sign if you have the attacker constantly assaulting and you induce a lot of losses. The problem if you compare the Ukrainian loss bars to what Ukraine gets, you will see that while Russia will get not a full replacement of their war losses, because these are basically two years, almost two years of war, but a partial replacement of their war losses. While on the Ukrainian side, material is getting shorter and it will be a particularly hard year this year because we have not yet set up a plan how to, on the long run, produce the armored fighting vehicles Ukraine needs to sustain the war, but our deep storage of second-hand equipment has expired. Um, it's a very similar situation with regard to ammunition. Last year, Ukraine fired roughly 2.4 million shots of artillery ammunition of the various cal calibers. Uh, out of this, uh, uh, more than uh, 1.5 million came from storages. Uh, the Americans last year produced roughly 300,000 rounds a new uh, 
Europeans produced roughly 650,000 rounds. We delivered roughly half of that to Ukraine. The rest went into our own armed forces, went to exports. Um, defense industrial capacity to produce ammunition will increase. Uh, this year, Americans should be able to produce roughly 600,000 rounds. Uh, Europeans should be able to produce roughly 1.2 million rounds. But of course, the storage that has supplied Ukraine until now has expired and our production is not yet at full pace because we will reach a quite good level of, of new ammunition production by the end of this year as we have spent the money on it last year. And that makes a gap in equipment. Uh, the problem is, and I'm going back uh, to this chart, if you, uh, you also see that main battle tanks and infantry fighting vehicles uh, are the, the two things that, uh, are, uh, that undergo the highest rate of attrition. Because artillery systems, air defense systems, they are further back to the front. Uh, they don't get killed on such a high pace. For artillery systems, the use of barrels is, is the, the limiting factor. Um, Russia, for example, burns through a lot of barrels and reimports them from North Korea. That's why they're using a lot of very old Soviet vintage artillery. Not because it's so good, but you get North Korean barrels for them. Um, but for tanks and infantry fighting vehicles, uh, the problem is you need to produce new stuff because also when they go bust, they're usually dead for good. Um, artillery systems usually in the rear get damaged and can be repaired. And this is a huge problem that the West and the Europeans have not yet addressed, either by defense industrial means or by, um, by uh, looking for more equipment that they can face out of their own armed forces. There is a silver lining to this. Ukraine has resurrected its defense industry or is in the process of resurrecting its defense industry. They produce now roughly 50 infantry fighting vehicles per year. Uh, well, they have lost over 700 in this war. So 50, of course, is a rather low number if you want to go into war supplies. But 50 infantry fighting vehicles a year is more infantry fighting vehicles than all of Europe produces together. So, um, well, yeah. The, the problem for, for Ukraine, um, the because of domestic industrial production, the material front could get substantially better after 2026 because for Ukraine they will produce quite a variety of new defense goods this year and by the beginning of next year but until they are available in quantities that make a difference it's 2026 there's one catch to that until then we really need to protect Ukrainian cities otherwise these factories get bombed into rubble uh, and that's why we have now, and that's why uh, in every European meeting, we have a scramble to get air defense missiles, especially those capable of intercepting ballistic missiles, in effect, Patriots. Um, and how far and how many Patriots we will get, we will probably decide survival in the war on the Ukrainian side. Yeah, so that is... That is roughly how the war will progress. It does not look very good from this moment. However, there is a lot of doom and gloom that is unjustified as of now because we still have the financial and military potential to turn things around. We just have to commit. That is a political problem. That is a financial problem for a lot of member states to discuss, but it's nothing that is undoable. What we should not take into account are the normal options. First of all, to hope for a ceasefire. Um, this is widespread in the West, especially in Washington DC and in Berlin. Even these days, there is the constant belief that there will be a ceasefire. Uh, when I was in Washington DC in April, before the start of the counteroffensive, uh, the prevailing mood in Washington was there will be one counteroffensive and then Putin will negotiate. Well, he didn't. 
And spoiler alert, even if the Ukrainian counteroffensive would have been successful, Putin would not have negotiated. He would have continued his war of attrition from an adverse line. But even with a fully successful counteroffensive, Ukrainian army was not in a position to completely vindicate the Russian forces. Um, we shall, if we shall go back to the, which is always in discussion floating up, the April 2022 negotiations, we see actually how far the two are apart. Uh, this was not a ceasefire as it was agreed upon or something that flied. The Russians wanted the Ukrainian army to be restricted to 85,000 men and 350 armored fighting vehicles. So main battle tanks and infantry fighting vehicles and other fighting vehicles put together, which is de facto demilitarization and making Ukraine vulnerable to any renewed attack. Second, Russia wanted to have the security guarantees to be bound to a unanimous decision amongst all guarantor states. So basically, Russia had a veto that when it attacked Ukraine again, the other countries could not do anything. But the Russian proposal also included that all military to military relations and arms sales to Ukraine by the West were prohibited. So, of course, you just have to wait and the Ukrainian army would degrade and then you can attack again. Um, Putin also uh, was unwilling to put anything about the occupied territories in the treaty. Ukraine at the time still hoped that or could at least negotiate a return to the boundaries of uh, February 23rd. Uh, but Russia wanted nothing to do with it. And now they have formally annexed four further oblasts. Um, so even on that, uh, this proposal has not provided any ground for a compromise in April 2022 and the stakes have only risen and things got harder. Of course, there's constant news about a possible ceasefire and the possibility of negotiations and the Russians are using this very cleverly because they know that in the West, diplomacy is seen as something more civilized than war, something that transcends war, something that would end the war. In Russia, Diplomacy is seen as a tool of war. You engage in negotiations to get better preconditions for military actions, not to end them or to suppress them. Uh, this is very much similar to the way Slobodan Milosevic in the Balkan Wars has conducted its negotiations. Um, if you remember all the Van Stoltenberg plans and Van Owen plans for Bosnia, they were all negotiations that were continuing, continuing, continuing to distract the West from what is happening militarily on the ground. And militarily, things were happening on the ground as uh, Belgrade at the time pleased because they had the advantage of having the armed stockpiles of the former Yugoslav People's Army, where the Croats and Bosnians had nothing and there was a universal arms embargo. So as long as you negotiate and keep the universal arms embargo, you can do whatever you want on the ground. Then NATO intervened in 1994 and due to NATO intervention, the Republika Srpska was, well, short of collapse. And suddenly Milosevic, of course, signed the Dayton Agreement. Not that what is in the Dayton Agreement was not known or negotiated before. It was negotiated years before, but you only start to take this seriously once you're on the losing side on the battlefield. And the same mentality is, is with Putin. He's basically Milosevic with nukes. Um, the problem is, of course, for Ukraine to get into the position that the Croats and the Bosniaks were in, in 1995 is quite a tall order. It's not unfeasible, but it's a tall order. The other thing that is widely debated is the issue of land for peace. Um, shouldn't Ukraine freeze the war? agree, okay, these territories are lost, but the rest of Ukraine gets integrated into you and NATO and sort of is happily every after. As I said before, this kind of talk about the West German model is seen differently from Ukraine because there is no East Ukraine as there was in East Germany. The other problem is, as long as the war is still ongoing, what territory then exactly is NATO territory and will be defended by the alliance as such if you promise them NATO membership? Uh, it is, in short of a ceasefire, there will be no agreed demarcation line. 
if there's no agreed demarcation line where does alliance territory start, it would be politically quite impossible to divide Ukraine into a real alliance territory and a gray zone. I don't think a lot of, especially those countries who have past historical experience with being divided up would support that. And then on a final stage, if you induce the perspective of NATO membership into a negotiating or peace proposal, who guarantees NATO membership? We've seen over the past years, Greece has blocked Northern Macedonia for the namesake. France and Germany in 2008 have blocked Ukraine and Georgia. Turkey has and Hungary have made a fuss about Sweden and Finland, and Sweden and Finland compared to Ukraine, where a war is still going on, is much easier to swallow. And while a lot of European countries actually might now, of course, say lip service, yes, of course, Ukraine has the right to join the NATO. But under the condition of a still ongoing war, to introduce a gray zone where Russia is, where sort of Article 5 is quite mushy because you have occupying troops and the demarcation line is not so sure and you have transitional territories, etc. It's the ideal playground for Russia to actually test the resolve and that is what Europeans are most afraid of. Not a full contingent of a Russian invasion that you know tries to drive NATO into the Atlantic in four days, but this kind of continuous testing and undermining of Article 5 to the point that NATO as a political body and security guarantor becomes useless. Yeah. So politically, while this may, I mean, such ideas make good op-eds in the newspaper, they are basically impossible to, to implement practically. Could there be bilateral security guarantees? Of course they could. But just as I remember, all the security assistance treaties that Ukraine has concluded with other G7 and NATO member countries are assistance measures. No, none of the um, of the Western countries is really willing to give a security guarantee in terms of promising Ukraine that it will enter war on its behalf if Russia attacks. And to be frank, it would arguably quite difficult to do that for a lot of countries, even if they want to promise it, because the beauty of a collective security organization like NATO is if the other side attacks, we are all at war. So you have you don't have to ponder about the other country's reactions and you have prepared defense plans, what is supposed to happen in the case of boom. And then there are multiple scenarios. But if you only have bilateral security guarantees, actually in the event of an aggression, the Germans don't know what the French will do, the French don't know what the Americans will do. Maybe there is political tumult in Washington and you have a guy like Trump, so you actually don't know what he's going to do anyway. Um, all that makes bilateral security guarantees quite vulnerable in terms of crisis stability. And this is exactly the reason why we only have security assistance measures. Because none of the countries has either a domestic mandate in terms of voters would support, I don't know, a German division on the FDFK sector to keep it quiet. Nor the capabilities to, to grant security on their own. And the only country that would have are the Americans and they don't have the domestic mandate. So the last kind of shadow boxing with something, something that is proposed but utterly in, unimplementable is neutrality and the idea of making Ukraine a neutral state. Um, first of all, all these past concepts about the buffer states and getting out of in between, etc., were based on the perception that Russia is a rational actor that is just. Uh, interested in its passive security, which we know by now it is not. It is about Russian identity. It's an irrational actor. The second thing is, during the Cold War, and this is for me as an Austrian actually more obvious than, of course, to current Americans, during the Cold War, it was quite an effort to keep neutrals alive. It was not an effort-free event. Uh, and it was made by the Americans. It was part of the of Washington's geopolitical DNA that every um, 
country opposed to the Soviet Union, I'm not even saying every free democracy, every country opposed to the Soviet Union deserves American support. The biggest recipient of foreign military aid from Washington in the early 50s and late 40s was Yugoslavia after the Tito-Stalin split. There were even common, uh, there were general staff consultations between Tito uh, and Montgomery, who at the time was uh, the Mediterranean commander of NATO, about how to commonly defend against Soviet aggression between Yugoslavia and NATO. Uh, Austria, uh, America gave an explicit guarantee for stress survival when the Soviet Union uh, invaded Hungary in 1956. Uh, the informal consultations when they invaded the Czech Republic. There were permanent military consultations with Sweden about a possible reaction to a Russian aggression, and Swedish air bases were part of uh, the U.S. nuclear strike plan against the Soviet Union should a war in Europe erupt. Um, Sweden and Finland had clandestine military relations with the U.S. Um, Austria, while the proponent of contemporary neutrality say that while Austria in the Staatsvertrag it was written that it was neutral, no, it was not. Austria's neutrality was a unilateral de declaration uh, in the neutrality law of um, October 26, 1955. The state treaty, the Austrian state treaty, sorry, I know it, had clauses that were called Anschlussverbot. We were forbidden to have a military alliance with Germany, and we, had, we were forbidden to have a customs or political alliance with Germany, but not with any other state. Now, if you look into the Cold War order of battle, in the Cold War, NATO had three regional commands in Europe, north, center, south. South, the headquarter was in Rome. Mr. Montgomery was the first Allied commander there. Where was the boundary between center, and which was Germany, and south? Was it the Alps? No. It was the Austrian-German border. Because Austria was also forbidden to have a military alliance with Germany, it said nothing about Italy. And in the case of war, of course, we would be subordinated to the Rome-based Southern Command. That was our neutrality. Um, the problem is this geopolitical DNA of the Americans that every non-aligned country deserves support and is to be supported even militarily. This is gone. <laughs> I mean, Donald Trump <laughs> leads the polls in, U uh, in the US. Um, uh, we, 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 you know, the who shall guarantee, who shall again maintain Ukraine as a neutral state uh, unless you have this clear mechanism and even if you don't agree on it formally, you need to have the informal knowledge that the United States in an emergency will be on your side to go down that path, which we don't have. So all these, all these scenarios make very good op-eds but they make very bad policy. Um, for the time being, the war will continue. It will continue for some years. That's the bad news and the sobering news. And even if the war ends, there will not be peace. The, the, war, the war has entrenched this anti western hysteria in the Russian the war has radicalized Russian society to a point we have never seen before. The Russian security apparatus is structurally involved in war crimes, if not genocide, in the occupied territories. If you and if you are if you have done that, and as an Austrian I can tell you that that's unfortunately true. You you clinch on to every stupid lie, regardless how stupid, that rationalize your behavior. Because if you have done the stuff that the Russians do in the occupied areas, you don't want to question yourself morally and politically why you have supported that or why you have done that. And if even the most stupid, outrageous nonsense provides you the, with the situational comfort 
that you acted under pressure or served your country with what you did, you'll take that. The Germans cut the corner in 1945 because they're occupied. Even if Ukraine's w Ukraine win, Russia will not be occupied. If Russia wins, then we have radicalized, militarized Russia on our borders that supports general military confrontation with the West. So this will also not be peace. So even if the war ends, we will not have peace. Yeah, but my speech ends here.